So this is the cross. But what happened after the cross? All over Houston today, people are preaching about the cross, the cross, the cross, and the resurrection. But what happened those three days? We were talking about this on Friday night. What happened those three days between the cross and the resurrection? This is what happened, verse 15. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. Triumph in the Greek is translated to make an acclamatory procession. A acclamatory procession. That's like a wave of vibrant energy surging through the air where jubilant cheers and thunderous applause like a pet rally or a, the bulls. I remember the bulls rally. The whole city was just on fire. People on the streets waving shirts and you know it's a jubilancy. Oh, yeah, yeah, amen. But who was doing the cheering? Who was doing the cheering? Why, why was there this, 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 this parade and cheering and shouting and, you know, like this vibrant energy in the air and shouting at you? Who was cheering? Remember when we read earlier today? He led captivity. What is it that he ascended, but he also descended? And then he led captivity captive. That is the dead. All those in hell. This, that when the light of the world entered into hell and Jesus came in as the head of all principality and power, they began to erupt in cheers and jubilation. Matthew 27 says this. Let's look at Matthew 27, verse 50 through 54. This is a very unfrequently uh, studied scripture. Matthew 27, 50 through 54. I don't know if we have that on the screen. But it says, when Jesus... When he cried again with a loud voice, he yielded up the ghost. People always say, where do you see people screaming in church? That's not scripture. It's all over scripture. You know, Jesus here cried with a loud voice. He yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth quaked. And the rocks ripped into. This is in the natural. If you could imagine this is happening in the natural. Imagine the rumbling in hell when the light of the world entered in. The veil was ripped. The earth quaked. The rocks rent. And I've heard it said, I don't know if it's true, but one archaeologist by the name of Tom Wyatt, he said that, that the Ark of the Covenant, is it was under Golgotha, the cross where Jesus was. And when his blood was shed and his blood dripped down to the earth, and the earthquake took place, and the blood dripped down between the earth, it actually landed on the physical mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. This is what uh, the, the Ron Wyatt, who is the archaeologist, said. And it says in verse 53 here, or let's start at 52. It says, The graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. So these were dead saints. Abraham, Isaac, J J Jacob, you know, Ezekiel, Jonah, all of the dead saints that were asleep, their bodies rose from the dead. And verse 53 says this, it says, they came out of the graves. They came out of the graves after his resurrection, and they even went into Jerusalem and appeared to many people. Many people alive in Jerusalem at this time saw Abraham, Isaac, Ezekiel, all the prophets come out of the graves and walking in the city of Jerusalem. It wasn't just Jesus. Now, when the centurion and they that were with him were watching Jesus, they saw the earthquake and those things which were done, and they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. In hell itself, 
Jesus entered and Jesus told you're here so the devil can't stop you. Amen. There's different Greek words for power. And every single one was used in Ephesians 1, 20 through 23. The first one is dunamis. This word refers to inherit power, strength, or ability. It's firepower. Say firepower. It's the bullet. It's the gun. It's the bomb. It's the, it's the firepower. In scripture, it denotes miraculous or supernatural power. Then two, azusia. Azusia conveys the idea of jurisdiction, the idea of authority. It refers to the right, say right, the right to exercise control or dominion. So there's Azusia. Thirdly, there's Kratos. Kratos, this term denotes might or strength, particularly in the sense of dominion or sovereignty. So whenever there's a revival, if you study history, you hear about the Great Awakening, the first revival, the second revival, the Azusa Street revival. It's like a tornado or a hurricane. A hurricane would spin around over a region. And everything that that hurricane is going over is just ripping up everything, tearing down everything. Everything's being sucked up, you know, when you're in a hurricane. Well, this is, this is, the, this is, the, this is what Kratos looks like. It's when the power of God sits over a, a city or a church or a community, and for six months, seven months, eight months, one year, two years, some revivals have gone six, seven years, that people that even just drive past it get saved, people that walk past it get saved, it's the Kratos power of God. And you can't get to that kind of power with a two-hour service once a week. Can't do it. It takes continual daily gathering and prayer and hunger to bring that kind of power. And that's why we don't have revival in America, because people in America want less quiet, smaller service, smaller service, smaller service, to the point where they want to have service online. And it's 30 minutes, 20-minute sermon. You're not going to have the Kratos hurricane of God shake a region with that kind of power. When the, the times that we've had that, when in America we had that, the entire country went dry. The entire nation went dry. Uh, Billy Sunday would go into cities and preach. Every single bar would shut down and the prisons would shut down. There would be no more prisoners because people stopped committing crimes in the entire metropolitan. That's the Kratos power of God. And then thirdly, in Ephesians 1 verse 20, is the word ishkis. Say ishkis. Ishkis signifies strength. Or might, focusing on inherent capability, force, 